The railroad came to Clinton in 1869. The population at that time was about 500. In 1900, the population of Clinton was 2,900. It was then that Clinton stopped being a typical Indiana town. Coal miners were needed, and they were needed quickly. Clinton truly became a melting pot. Nearly 30 nationalities from across Central Europe migrated to the coal mines of Clinton. There they found new economic opportunity and a new way of life. Missy Moore talks with Marcos and Andrea. What year did you come over here? I came to this country uh, February the 14th, 1914. What was the trip like coming over? The trip was very bad. We left Italy the last day of 1913. We didn't, we was broke down on sea for three weeks and the ship was ready to sink. We had a foot and a half of water in our bedrooms already. We was locked up for three weeks. They used to feed us through a little porthole. After we got here, the ship was uh, infected, so I was tickled to death to see the, the Statue of Liberty, but it didn't do me much good. They transferred us out in a island and we was there for almost a whole month why did your father choose to come to clinton well my dad came to clinton on account he had uh, relations over here my dad came here back in 19 9 or 10 and he was here three to four years and he made enough money to go back to italy and get his family and come back over here. That's why he would come to Clinton. When you got your job here, what'd you do? What your first? Well, I went to school only four years in Jacksonville. I was in the sixth grade, and my dad wasn't in very good health, so he took me in the coal mine back in 1918. <laughs> so I was only over here four years and I had to go to work. The mine blow for work, I go to work. The mine didn't blow for work, I go to school to learn to speak. Because I didn't know, I didn't know English at all. The Hillcrest Community Center offered citizenship classes for immigrants. The Hillcrest Center also offered craft and recreational facilities. What did it take for you to become an American citizen? Well, I went to school that Hill Chris, it was a fellow by the name of White. He taught us the preamble, everything about this country, how it's run and all that. And so he said, you shouldn't have any trouble being that you had a little school to answer all these questions. He said, hey, you go to Newport There'll be a man there, and he'll examine you. <laughs> to tell you the truth, it was something funny for me, because when I went for my citizenship paper, this man come up and he said, why did George Washington ride a white horse? I looked at the man and I told, well, I didn't read nothing like that, but it come to my mind. I said, he rode a white horse because I said he wanted to show that the stripes in our flag shows white purity. And he said, give that gentleman his papers. He knows something about it. That's the way I got my papers. One question now, what would you answer? I don't know. <laughs> Missy Moore and Jody McGee talk with Joe Arola. How long have you lived in um, Clinton? 61 years and two weeks. Um, what What was it like coming over on the boat? When I came in here in 1920, 
He looked like a pastor. People left the car, cow loom along right here, and pastor right here. But no house back there, no house here. 1920, uh, Clinton was booming, nice. A lot of miners working good. Uh, Clinton was better than 10,000 that time. Every house had a boarding, five, six people in there. Eat and eat and drink, sleep there, then go back to work in the mine. And mine working good. What did you do when you first came over for a living? Well, first, I come here, uh, there's only one, a mine. I work in the mine, up from Langford. When I come home in the evening, I make sausage and salami. Nighttime. To make, we start making salami and salami to 1920. But just a little bit. There were a few customers only. Then I got a little bigger. Then 1933 was only one thing to do. Quit the mine or start my sausage business. One of them too, I can't keep up to business. So I quit the mine, I'll make sausage. I make sausage in 1970, 50 years. And we get along pretty good. The river sausage all over in Clinton, Terre Haute. Get along fine. How did you make your sausage? We make sausage, we had a hand grinder, everything. Uh, first we started, we make it in my basement. And at night time, and in the morning, we want to deliver. First I started with the bicycle. I had a big basket in the front. I went over around here, 9th Street, 10th, 11th Street. Then, bicycle was too small, I got the horse in the wagon. I went with that. I bought a centenary, then my ocean won't go no more. So I bought me Marley. That was a rich man then. Troy Helt visited Pete Guerry. And did you work in the mines also? Oh yes, I started working in a coal mine when I was 11 years old. 11 years old. I'd done everything in a coal mine. By starting out 11 years old, you learn a lot. I dug coal, I drove mule, I run motor, yeah. I worked 21 years in the coal mine. And did they use canaries at the mine you were at? Well, no, because there was no gas there. There's no gas there. Yeah. You see, the only time they use canaries is when there's gas. Then the canary dies and you better get out of there. But where I worked at three different mines, no gas. And what mines did you work at? Keller 2, Cronial 5, and Cronial 6. And where were these mines located? Out setting there, just four miles, four and five miles west of town. Okay. West and of Clinton. do you remember any disasters at these mines while you worked there or any other time they were running? Oh, yes. There was, uh, in 1938, New Year's Eve, there was a big fire. And there were 20 men trapped. But they was fortunate enough, all but one, to get out. Cy Mattiota was one of the men trapped in the mine disaster in 1938. Could you tell us about the, the explosion that happened in the mine? Well, when that happened, we didn't know what happened. Because uh, when the fire broke out, the motorman had already gone out, and nobody would come by, but they couldn't get to us. We didn't know what was going on because the telephone wire had burned down. And we didn't know, we just waited. It was about 10.30 in the morning when we found out that we were in there no, that we couldn't get out. We didn't know we couldn't get out. But I'm sure there was the last of us because there was uh, 20 of us sitting there and we just sat on pilot the, the gob, we call it down there. Stuff that we couldn't load in the car, we'd put a sit on it, we are sitting there. You couldn't hardly breathe because your heart was just pounding in your forehead, your, your temple here was just hurting. I had old man, Mr. Newport, I know you folks remember Richard Newport, his dad. He was the oldest one and I was the youngest. I used to sit in a, on the gob and had a piece of cardboard. I'd fan him and fan myself. I could feel a breeze there, but there was nothing there because the oxygen was all gone. And you've been a nice dad as far as that concerned. And every once in a while, we, uh, two of us take a walk up the railroad, uh, to, to, uh, to main line, and go as far as we could. Then we come back and report to see if the fire was coming our way. We know there was something wrong, but we didn't know it. But all we go so far, probably a quarter of a mile or something like that, and we could see smoke. But there was nothing to push the smoke down on us. If they just pushed the smoke down on us right away, it would have killed us all right away. And Jess Hayes and Blue Hollings were, uh, yeah, Blue Hollings, we went up to check one time, neither one came back. 
but Blue Hollingwood had a brother, Miles, he was working there. And he asked us to go with him. I said, well, what's he used to go? I said, we're all going to be dead before long anyway. I said, they're probably gone. But that was his brother. So he decided to go out there. He came back. They crawled out there, and he came back with his brother. But Jess Hayes already dropped dead. So when we came back, we just waited and waited there. And nothing you could do, just to leave. Try not to move more than you have to, because we didn't have no light or nothing, because there was no oxygen. And about, it was about, uh, well, about one or two o'clock, one o'clock in the morning, right behind us was some uh, old works. And we happened to look around, we seen lights coming towards us. In the meantime, they put the air to us. And Albert, uh, uh, Columbo, Charlie Columbo was the first one I seen. They, ran, they came toward us, but in the meantime, they had the air behind them <coughs> and the lights on. And they, 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 we had two men on each side of us who carried, took us out. We went through uh, old works that had been worked years before. There was water, we waded through water and over a big uh, falls till they got us out on top. And when we got up on top there, the hospital ambulance were there. They picked us two at a time and took us down to the hospital. And they gave us our bat down there, and they gave us all a shot of whiskey to help us along. Well, what did you think when you saw the light? Well, we don't know. We just got so happy. We just jumped, all jumped up and started running toward that light. Much as we, could, we couldn't run very fast, but we all moved toward those lights when we saw them coming. Pete Guerry. There was no other business. None? No. There were no factories or nothing. There was nothing. And that's when, when the mine shut down, that's when a lot of people left Vermilion County. That's when these small towns started to, to fold, up. fold up. Yep, that's when they started to fold up. When the mines all went down, so did yep. the little towns. After the mines closed, bootlegging became prevalent in this area, as Geraldine Monticello learns. You saw a lot of bootlegging and a lot of whiskey and alcohol running through this basement, didn't you? Yes, and throughout the whole town. It was a, a way of making a living for many years for the people of this uh, community. And this involved all different sorts of people, didn't it? That's the right, all nationalities, and there was no one exempted from it. They made a living by selling and bootlegging and manufacturing of alcohols. What where did they store their uh, materials and how did they keep them hidden in their homes? Well, each, each family that, that uh, was involved had their secret hiding places. A lot were hard to find, some were easy. It just depends how much time and, and work they devoted to their hiding places. We've been looking around in the basement down here for quite a while, and there's a lot of different places where a still or the alcohol could have been kept. Can you tell us, or can you show us, where the actual hiding place was? Here is one. Here. Now what was kept under there? The finished product. Five and one gallon cans. And it was just stored down stored there. there. Yes, it had racks to keep it off the ground. And how approximately how large is that area down there? It's approximately eight foot by twelve foot. And how high? Uh, about four and a half foot. Four and a half foot. And how many people would be working down here, storing these cans or working with the still? One, one man handing, and sometimes two men inside, or one and one. One hand in one store and stack them. So there were never more than about five people working on the whole operation? That's right. What was it like during the Depression? It was, well, uh, it was bad first. Then uh, Uncle Sam came in and they, they, they saw the double PA. The people work, fix the sidewalk, fix the road. It was good. Everybody get a job who need the job. And they done lots of work in Clinton. They fixed a lot of sidewalk all over. Then, lots of bootlegger moved on too. That was the worst thing. But that's all it was. There was no work. Everybody, a lot of people make good. Make what they call brandy. And uh, they get by pretty good. They make a living. They, they sell it, retail. 
deixou lá a estátua de Anápolis. Tipo o caminho de Guerreiro, o Fagel on Jog, Carwin, na Car, Big Traffic. Aí isso dali vai chegar. Com sugar. Não, mas não tem nada de nada. É só. Mas isso. Há pessoas, muitas pessoas têm muito bom. Muitas pessoas fazem dinheiro e muitas pessoas têm dinheiro. Tudo bem. Tudo bem. Tudo bem. Tudo bem. Você poderia nos dizer o que Clinton foi like durante esse tempo e o que os deals foram indo? Clinton, durante esse tempo, não era nada diferente do que qualquer outro lugar. Only there was just a little bit of booze made here and there in quite a few places. As far as I go, if you want to tell the truth about it, there's quite a few places. But you take uh, with all the coal mines here and all of them down, they just done it to make a living. Yeah. There never was a rich person come out of it. They done it to make a living. That's the only thing I can say about in the bootlegging days. North 9th Street was part of a section of Clinton called Little Italy. Over one-third of Clinton's population was Italian. The Italian community celebrated Columbus Day since the early 1900s. The Little Italy Festival has been held in Clinton since 1966. I used to stamp 50, 60 bushels of grape, local grape. I used to get the grape, go grape, grape from Colondai, syndicate, all over, go get them and the truck. Even I got some by Brazil. Local, local grape. Now they stamp it. California grape. They got no more grape. They no stamping. I like to have a nice grape fresh. And when it's stamping, we change grip two, three times. No grip in the world. I've done that ten years. When you were Ray and Regina with your wife, um, what did you have to do around the festival? We uh, traveled around all over. I was a poor man and worked all my life. I guess it wasn't the only pleasure I had, actually, is when I got to be king and queen. Then. We lived it up. I was a great polka dancer. And I'm well known for that. And my wife, she's awful good polka dancer too. How did the immigrant square come into being? Well, this my favorite place because one something to represent the miner. This this granite, black black rock, looks like coal. See, we built this one here first. Then they want something else besides the fountain. So here we got to have somebody represent the immigrant. So I had a picture I brought from Italy and said this is what we want. So this represent the immigrant when he left Italy or when he get here in the United States. We got a valise and say hello to everybody. <laughs> that's what that's what happened. What happened when uh, when you get New York? You say hello to everybody. And same thing happen when you leave your home. Work and peace. That's the main thing I want. And I got it today. I find out this country is one of the best in the world. And uh, we gotta say thank you and, and good thank you too, because there's no country better than this. <laughs>